So I have the privilege of giving the first of these talks, and you guys have the privilege of hearing me give it. It's going to be great. <laughs> I, I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining to you these words, reclaiming da Vinci, right? And I think this, this talk that I'm going to give you is very, um, it could get me in a lot of trouble uh, at a liberal arts school where there's art faculty here, art historians, art professors, art students. And there are actually mathematicians here and statisticians here. And uh, when I'm starting to use these words that I really don't understand, um, it could be offensive. But I want to basically make a case for a point that I want to get at by explaining you this title first. So these words, reclaiming da Vinci, of course, it's motivated by Leonardo da Vinci. And what was amazing about Leonardo, which is, uh, which is true universally accepted, is the fact that he was this quintessential Renaissance man, right? He, he not only was amazingly gifted in art, was amazingly gifted in the visual display of information, whether, just look at, this, uh, look at this quick snapshot here, right? This is just from a sketchbook. Just the way he conveys information. His goal is not to be artistically talented here. His goal is to just study the human anatomy, just to be a biologist. And yet he's using the power of his artistic gifting to express it. Just the angle in which he approaches drawing the skull gives you the information about how the skull and the vertebrae touch each other, how the backbone is connected, where the tendons are. And not only is the fact that he's gifted in several disciplines, including mathematics or engineering and the worry about ratios, the constructions of not just theoretical mathematics, but mathematics applied, building helicopters, building tanks or proposed prototypes for this thing. What's amazing about da Vinci is that he blurred the ground between these things. And if you just look at Williams College as an example, because we're all here, the, the dangerous part about trying to reclaim da Vinci is the fact that we are already fragmented. Right? Just look, division one, division two, division three. Right? And even they're, they're fragmented by a road that goes right across campus. So we see that there's, uh, there's, the, there's the math and the science department, division three, then there's division one on one side, then there's <coughs> division two with the soft sciences. And how can we integrate all these pieces of the puzzle? Oh, I'm sorry, is there a technical word? I'm, uh, <laughs> social sciences, all right, there you go. Um, I told you it's going to be a very offending talk, right? But, but how can we, as a whole, try to bring these back together? Well, one of the reasons it's even there, these divisions are there in the first place, is because each of these fields, compared to the time of Leonardo, has exploded. To understand just mathematics itself will take you lifetimes to know all the subjects that it spans, from topology and geometry, to analysis, to algebra, to polynomial ideas, graphing it, thinking about it in different ways, higher dimensions, much less art, much less engineering, and much less literature and poetry. So how can we try to reclaim da Vinci? That's a, <coughs> excuse me, that's a bold statement to make. What I want to do is try to offer you a way this can happen, at least a piece of an attempt that we can make in order to do this. So it is explained, this whole talk can be explained, how this can be happened by a quote from my favorite movie, The Princess Bride. And uh, this is how success can be had. Right? Life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. So let me explain to you and back it up and describe for you what I tell the first day of class to all my students. I say, if you want to have an understanding of what differential equations is about, what calculus is about, what linear algebra is about, what topology is about, geometry is about, the understanding is right here. It's beautiful. It's great. This is what everybody in academics works for. This is what we are in love with. But in front of this understanding is a brick wall. And your goal, and I will, of course, help you facilitate this process, is to go through the brick wall. And the weapon of choice that you are given is your head. <laughs> I don't mean your mind. I mean your head. You use your head and smash it against the brick wall till eventually, hopefully, the brick wall cracks before your head does. But blood will come down. It'll trickle through your eyes. You will not be able to see. But eventually, the wall will crack, and this understanding is yours. You see, nothing that's worth getting is, not, is actually worth investing pain for. Right? So there is no slide I have that I'm going to show you that will say, this is the way da Vinci will be reclaimed. It's through a painful process when there's so much information out there. How can we bring it together? It's through a painful process that I want to try to do this. So that's a cool tone. All right. So let me start by, um, by talking about art. Uh, and I want to preface this word art, or the word artist, by what I mean today. So of course, if you look at Shakespeare, he's an artist. Right? 
He has created works of art. If you look at Einstein, his ideas of special relativity and general relativity about how gravity can work with matter and time and space and energy, that's a work of art. Right? So we can all say, look at the Nobel laureates, look at the Pulitzer Prize winning photographers. These are works of art and what they're producing and the way the world has evaluated it. But when I say an artwork or when I say an artist, I mean specifically in the classic sense, somebody who's been gifted in the visual arts, somebody who can use their hands to create something, somebody who can use their vision to display something in a visual way. Right? So although there's these great definitions, that's the definition I want to focus on. So what do I mean by art? Well, if we look at the intersection of math and art, where do they fit together? Right? That's, I'm a mathematician, so that, that's the stuff I'm interested in. Where does math and art fit together? What I did over the past month is look through math journals and find out what do mathematicians think how math and art fits together? And what do artists think? How do they think how math and art fits together? And here are some snapshots of their ideas. Right? Here's one example. Piero della Francesca, you might know this name, and this is one of the works that he did. It's the Flagellation of Christ. He did this around 1455 to 1460 in that range. And what's amazing, what is known is that this is not a great work about perspective, but this is the great work about perspective, right? That's what it's known. And it's used by art historians as a great example of using geometry, using construction, using ratios, to, to display this thing, what's more amazing about this particular painting, what's brilliant, is this low angle design, this angle where his camera is coming from, where his eye is looking at. So notice the perspective of the three figures in the foreground, Christ in the center, a little bit off center to the left side, there's a man in the back watching on a stool, the perspective of the tower on top, the perspective of the little tiles, and the tiling of the ceiling where this is all taking place. In fact, you even see a tiling of the floor. It is perfectly done. This is one of the greatest examples of, you can say, how math and art fit together in a classic sense. All right, let's look at another one. So Marcel Duchamp, his work, um, everybody here would know this, New Descending a Staircase, work in 1912. What's amazing here that Duchamp is saying is how can we, fit, uh, how can we fit math and art together? One way that's demonstrated here is this, co is this, is this way he conveys four dimensions. Right? How do you convey more information than what you see normally? He's conveying four dimensions. So clearly you see this new descending staircase, this person has one of their hands in front of their body. Right? So Duchamp is, is showing you three dimensions. Right? He's showing you depth, width, height. He's displaying all these three, but he's also showing you this dimension of motion. He's not only showing you three dimensions, he's showing you this extra dimension. He's packing it in. Well, here's another painting, which, I, which is one of my favorites, which is showing you this extra fourth dimension around this time period, the early 1900s, which is the work by Salvador Dali, The Crucifixion. Uh, it's 1954. Now, what you see here is Christ on a cross, but the cross is not your typical Roman cross. So here is the idea that Dali has. You take a normal three-dimensional cube, you cut along the edges, and you can unfold the cube into a flat cross, a flat Roman cross, made up of squares. And Dali says, well, if I can do this for a three-dimensional cube, then I must be able to do it for a four-dimensional cube. So he takes a four-dimensional cube, he cuts, he rips the four-dimensional cube open, and what he does is he unpacks the four-dimensional cube made up of three-dimensional cubes. Just like the, the three-dimensional cube is made up of two-dimensional squares. So he's pushing us into the way of displaying four-dimensional cubes in this picture. But of course, he's bringing in religion. And again, you see perspective on the bottom by the tiling. He keeps track of all these things. But from a mathematical viewpoint, you can say he's conveying dimension. Right? He's conveying dimension. Let's just go to some current artists that I love. Here's an example of one, Julie Merithu. Right? Some of you guys might. <laughs> All right, some of you might uh, know her work. Um, this is a particular painting of hers, uh, Gray Space in 2006. Here's another one that I absolutely adore, Stadia 2, uh, Stadia 2 in 2004. She made a, a series of three of these. Uh, just as a side plug, she, her work is actually gonna be displayed here in the Williams College Museum of Art at, uh, at the middle of April through the middle of July. So I'm extremely excited to see this. What she is known for is a technique of layering, of trying to convey space in here, this particular piece, she's trying to convey the space in a stadium. But to me, what it actually looks like is um, something like an airport terminal. Right? You see she has the banners and the flags all around. And then you see, actually, there's motion. There's extreme chaos going on. But at the same time, you see this vastness of space. To me, I feel like this is a modern day Duchamp. It's like a new descending a staircase. You see this fourth dimensional activity on a th of a three dimensional space pushed onto a two dimensional canvas. In fact, her work is so appreciated that she won, in 2005, the MacArthur Fellowship. 
which is uh, sometimes called the genius grant. The MacArthur Foundation picks certain individuals and gives them half a million dollars, no questions asked, for being brilliant. That's it. And you can do anything with this money, right? You're not accountable for it. If you want, you can buy a Ferrari. And the reason they didn't give it to me is I would have bought a Ferrari, right? So it's an um, amazing thing that she does. Here's another person. I'm not sure if anybody in this audience would know about this person, Joshua Davis. And here are some of his works. Here's a collection of works. This is uh, from a collection called Tropsum. And here's one of his. What he does is uses um, a computer graphics tool called Adobe Illustrator. And what uh, Adobe Illustrator is, it's, it's a tool that you can use to draw with uh, on your computer that keeps everything in memory in terms of vector graphics. So it knows the angle and the curvature and how you draw everything. It knows the radius of the circle you're drawing, the color texture, the percentage of transparency you want to impose on it. He takes his drawings, which of course has a mathematical formula behind every one of his pieces in Illustrator that it saves as, and then he writes a software program that manipulates those mathematical equations. And these layered works have over tens of thousands of layers on them that you cannot do by hand. So he, again, is trying to bring together these weapons and tools in math and display them in different ways that is gorgeous. What I want to say right now before I switch gears a little bit is all these examples are completely flawed. That's my thesis. This is not the right way to bring math and art together. All right, this is what the world might say, this is what the journals might say, and it's a fun little cool thing. But no mathematician in current cutting edge research would say, now I finally get four dimensions. You know, Salvador, that really helps out. They wouldn't say this. So the question is, how can you bring math and art together the right way, right, from a mathematician's point of view? And that's what I want to share with you. So before we do this, we have to make a little excursion into this world of visualization. I think that's the right way to approach things. So let's talk about visualization. The right definition of visualization can be given by a quote from one of my favorite people, Stephen Colbert. Isn't he just funny just looking at him? All right, I just want to laugh just at that picture. It's great. And here's what he says. Equations are the devil's sentences. <laughs> and I think it's absolutely true. This is the concept of visualization. How do you take an equation, a mathematical equation, an equation that shows up in physics, that has mathematical notation and mathematical meaning, you know that integral sign, right? We know that equation, but it has some meaning, it has a visual concept. Does it, right, does it have a meaning that you can associate to it? How can you take a formula, how can you take a proof and represent it? How can you take data in, a, in an Excel file, in a spreadsheet? How can you take a historical paragraph, a paragraph that depicts a battle that happens in history, right, and depict it visually? This is the concept of visualization that we want to get across, right? So here's some examples of visualization. The first one is historical data, and this is one of my favorite examples in the world. It is the work by Charles Menard, made famous by Edward Tufte. And this right here is the march of Napoleon's failed attempt to take over Russia. On the left side, this is actually a geographical map. So on the left side, the brown strip you see is the thickness of the troops of Napoleon. That's the power of the strength of his troops. And on the right side, you see Moscow, right? And this is, the, this is uh, November and December of 1812 and January and February of 1813. And you see, as he is walking towards Moscow, just visually, you don't even need to know the numbers. As he's walking towards Moscow, they're dying. By the time they get to Moscow, less than 50%, just look at the snapshot, less than 50% of the guys are there. He's not going to win. And then there's the retreat, right? That's the black line. You see the retreat. And you see the retreat does not take the same path as they did there. They're taking a different path home. And on the retreat, you see the troops are just dying off. Not only that, you can see the details of some of the rivers here. In fact, this particular river crossing, you see less than 50% of the troops even made it across that river that day. And you might say, why is that? Well, look down this graph right here. This is the temperature scale at that time on the retreat. So right here in Moscow, it's zero degrees. That's pretty warm. And it eventually drops down all the way to negative 30 by the time they come home. And this river crossing is negative 25. It's negative 25 degrees when the troops cross, less than half die of a small fraction of the ones that even marched into Moscow. This information, 15 dimensions, 15 different variables, is packed into one graphic. This is one of the most beautiful views, I think, of visualization, how much you can pack information into something. Is it as accurate as the numbers themselves? Certainly not because right, you have to be very clever in how to dis display this thing, and that's an art form. But it gives you a bigger sense of picture and a very fast snapshot. Here's another one of visualization. Here's a program that Dick DeVos, our statistician here, um, 
uh, who told me about this thing. This is written by these four authors uh, as the startup project, but several other ones jumped in. And here's a snapshot from this program. What it is is, um, is a statistical data package that visualizes your, your data sets. So let me just sh share with you what's going on right here. You see this white circle. Imagine this white circle as a steering wheel. And what you're doing is you're in five-dimensional space. You're in five-dimensional space because that's, that's how much power you have to move these variables around. You have four different data sets that are all mixed together. And you want to know the relationship between these data sets, four different colors. You're in, five -dimensional, you're in this five-dimensional world here, exactly the coordinates in, in exactly where you stand, looking at the data set in, in, in this two-dimensional projection we see here, right? This is a steering wheel, and these four white spokes are the four different directions so far, and this fifth dark purple spoke is the direction you have your steering wheel control over. You can go forward or backward in that fifth direction to a certain degree. Now, we can actually rotate that steering wheel and use those spokes, and we can look at the data set. It's the same data set from a completely different perspective in five dimensions. You're moving in five dimensions, and you're pushing down, and you can see it. Right here, if you want to get nerdy, right here are the five numerical values exactly written down. In fact, we can do it again, and we can see the perspective here in five dimensions, pushing down into two. In fact, you can have the computer resolve it and asks, and you can tell it to, to solve this thing for you, in a sense, to make it look efficient, and you can get information like this, or even cleaned up like this. So the efficiency of how you look can be actually resolved by this thing, and it can actually give you more statistical information than what I'm just showing you. But here's a tool of how information from a spreadsheet, from data, can be packed and visualized with the power to move around in much higher dimensions. So we see we're taking Duchamp to a much different level. We're taking Dolly to a much different level with the power of computers nowadays. Of course, Dolly and Duchamp's their goal was not to talk about mathematics. They have several other goals as artists that they're trying to convey. But if that's the connection you want to make, here are some other arguments we can use. And the last thing I want to show you is this program <laughs> called Gen 3D. It's, uh, it's a program written by a, he's still a grad student in Carnegie Mellon. This guy's a genius. His name's Fritz Obermeier. I emailed him a bunch of times. Here's a snapshot of what this program gives you. All right, this is one of its outputs. It's stunning. And what this is, I claim, what this is, I claim, is um, a four-dimensional object. All right? Now, if you look at it and stare at it for a little bit, you might say, it's not a 4D object. That's, um, that looks 3D to me. I mean, it's like a ball you're holding in your hand. It looks really complicated. You know, a lot of structure on the inside of the ball. It's a three-dimensional thing. But let me explain to you what this, uh, what this, what this, why this should be considered 4D. Take, take the sphere, right? And imagine it's filled with water. It's all filled in. It's a three-dimensional sphere right in front of you, right? And it has all these cuts and marks on it. If you just think about it for a little bit, what's so exciting about this three-dimensional object is not the three-dimensional stuff that's in here. It's this two-dimensional shell where all the activity's going on. Right? That's where all the information is. That's where the cuts are. That's where the transitions are and the points are and the jumps are. Right? So what Fritz Obermeier did, he said, well, we can take this 3D thing, but what if you put your camera right at the surface of this object and fly on it? Right? Then what you're seeing is just a two-dimensional shell that encapsulates all the information. And so he takes four-dimensional objects, four-dimensional polytopes, and he takes his camera on the shell of that four-dimensional polytope, which is a three-dimensional world, and he flies on it, right? And this is a snapshot of what you see. So let's see if I can actually get this to work, right? Um, they can do this live, all right? So here, can you guys see that? The, all right. So here is actually the... Just pick a fun one. Right. So what you see right here is called the 120 cell. It's a four-dimensional object. It's, you're looking down on the surface of this four-dimensional object. It's a 120 cell, and it's the four-dimensional version of a pentagon. Right. So there's the, there's the two-dimensional version of a pentagon, which is a pentagon. A 3D one, it's called the dodecahedron. It has 12 pentagonal faces. You might have seen this before. And here's the 4D one. If you want to convince yourself, you can actually zoom in here. And you can see that there are 120 of these dodecahedron that you can just walk around, right? And this, what you're doing is you're actually on the surface of a 4D object, just flying right on top of it, right? And you can zoom out a little bit, and you can fly, right? And there you are. You're actually flying on the surface of a four-dimensional object. That's what Gen 3D allows you to do. Simply stunning. And the mathematical rigidity, the mathematical structure you see available here, isn't that gorgeous in terms of the power of computers? But yet, it's still a sense of visualization. 
are we going to the edge of cutting edge mathematics with this program? And the answer is no, all right, we're not. Some of you might say, well, what else do you need? What do you guys do, right, other than this stuff? <laughs> well, it's amazing to have a tool like this to get kids excited about it, to get faculty excited about it, to get the government and the grant people excited about this thing. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you're not pushing the forefront of mathematics. You see, Gen 3D was written by Fritz Obermeier, who needed to know exactly the composition of this coxeter type of this polyhedron to input into his computers, which is already done by mathematicians. So we know what we're doing. He's just showing us what we already know. That's not cutting edge math, right? That's just recasting the information in a different way, in a beautiful way, but it's just recasting it. So how can we push the forefront of math? That's the question. So the answer to that um, comes from looking at math itself. So now is the part of the talk where it gets serious and depressing, right? <laughs> but it doesn't. Um, let me, let me, and let me start by, by going back to the definition of what we talked about in the very beginning about the title of this talk itself, right? Um, reclaiming Da Vinci. So what does this mean? So on one side, we had the vision of Da Vinci himself in terms of the gifting he had as one individual, never compartmentalizing it into pieces, but using it freely, whether in one world or the other one. And today, if we want to talk about how math and art fit together, it turns out there's this divide. And almost every example that I've given you, almost every example I've given you, whether it's Dolly or Duchamp or Joshua Davis or even the work of Piero earlier on in the 1400s on perspective, every example has an arrow that goes this way. Right? In other words, they are, math, mathematics is a tool that had been used by these artists to communicate information in a powerful way. Right? You needed the mathematical underpinning that's in Adobe Illustrator in order to write that software code that manipulates that. You needed to understand four dimensional cubes, which mathematicians already did at that time period, in order to unpack it and represent it in a religious setting, in a different setting, which is what Dolly's brilliance was. You wanted to understand perspective in the time of Piero, and they did. They knew ratios far earlier than the 1400s, which he recast into a beautiful way of representing it. So the question is, this arrow is very much done. Math has helped art. Math has pushed art. Artists have used math. Thank you. That's fantastic. But here's the question. How do we finish this arrow, right? How can we have artists push mathematics? In other words, how can art help push cutting edge math? Now, let me be very clear. The works of art that you see today are amazing for PR reasons. For public relation reasons, you guys are going, wow, right, that's great. Maybe I should take a math course. Exactly, come on in, come on in. Because if you want to understand four dimensions or eight dimensions, take our courses. We'll tell you how the power, we will give you weapons to destroy and build things you have never seen before. It's gorgeous. Right? That's what the excitement of all these things in art are. You go to math journals that talk about art or art journals that talk about math, and it's always the black arrow. It always tells you how you use classical math things that's already been done into casting it in a way to get kids excited. Whether the end goal is public relations or to get excited, not the issue. But it's always been to bring and attract students into mathematics. But how can an artist, how can somebody visually gifted actually help push the current forefront of math? So I've talked to this with several mathematicians and statisticians, and many of them said, dude, you're nuts. It's not going to happen. This is not going to happen. So let me explain to you why I think my approach might work, and let me also explain to you why so far it has never happened. The number one reason, other than a handful of attempts, but the number one reason this red arrow does not exist as the way we do things in life, that's why the art department and the math department doesn't hang out, right? That's why we just don't have lunches together and say, really? Because that makes me think of my problems about moduli spaces. I never thought of it that way. We don't hang out because of one main reason. The reason is mathematicians. That's the reason. <laughs> it can be explained by this quote. I love this quote by Littlewood. Little, Littlewood was a math professor. His specialty was in number theory, and this is what he wrote. He said, a heavy warning used to be given that pictures are not rigorous. This has never had its bluff called and has permanently frightened its victims. You see, math is all based on proofs and rigor. How can we accept the gifts of those gifted visually if they're not going to give rigor for us? 
All they do is draw things. All they do is build things. But man, that's not math. Math is equations. Math is disgusting dirt you got to get into. That's the rigor. I mean, we all know, I know if you've especially taken a math class, it's easy to say, oh, right, I see how integral works. But then somebody says, oh, by the way, did you do your homework? You say, yeah, right? That's where the pain is, the <laughs> details, right? That's what we excel in. We can talk about big picture metaphors, but at the end of the day, we need to say, well, but does that case work? And does that case work? Or did you check for this particular function? And that's what Littlewood's trying to say. You see, the warning that's been given, the warning that's been handed to me by my advisor, and the warning that's been given to him by his advisor, everybody who's gotten a PhD or a master's has been trained this way, is rigor is the way things are done. The greatest journals look at rigor. And the way the training has been done goes as follows. Pictures are deceptive. You know the works of M.C. Escher, right? You know that the waterfall that never ends, or the hand drawing the hand, or, or you think of, you've, you've seen those cubes that you know, you know you really can't build it because one of the sticks is in the back, and it's, you could trick mathematicians that way. We don't buy pictures, we don't buy visualization, but you know equally well, and here's the counter argument, that equations are equally tricky. Half the times you don't even know what the equations mean anyway, right? So you just glance over it. But a lot of the other times, we know that you could divide by zero on both sides of the equation, which you don't even realize it, or multiply by infinity, and you might get an answer like one equals seven. So equations are equally tricky. The moral of the story to me is that the reasons I promote visualization and I push it hard is because we're usually erring on the other side of the story. Right? This is a affirmative action for visualization and math. That's what I believe in, right? Because it's been not represented enough at all. This is one of the reasons the red arrow doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because mathematicians don't want it. That's why. So here are some approaches that we can take, I think, where we can use the gifts of those in the art community, those who are visually gifted, whether you are a civil engineer who thinks things differently, or an artist who does classical painting or a sculptor, in hardcore, rigorous, cutting edge mathematics that people don't know the answers to. So here's some three snapshots, one in cartography, just to give you a glimpse of the stuff I'm interested in, one is in origami, and one is in configurations, or configuration spaces. So let's just start with cartography. So here is, uh, is the first topic in cartography that I want to look at, which is metro maps. Right? These are subway maps, right? maps of the subway system. And here's one of them. Right? You might know the city that this is the map is the subway system of. It's a famous city in the world. And this map is drawn exactly to scale. Right? So if you notice, the subway system, as you go farther and farther into the suburbs of the area, right, you need to, if you want to draw it in scale, you see that that's how far each subway stop is. But you know, you know that the subway system information is all packed in the center of the city. That's where everything's happening. That's where the lines are switching, right? That's where people are hustling and bustling. You know by the time you're going to take the green line, right, you know where that's going to end. That's not the exciting point. You need to know how to switch from the green line into the yellow line to the red line. That's where all the action is. And that's why, unfortunately, this map has like a little zoom in section, like, we suck, excuse us, right? And now it's zoomed in <laughs> to show the details of transition. So once you know the big picture, drawn perfectly to mathematical scale. You want to nerdify and give me the numbers exactly mathematically, it's perfectly there. But visually, it's flawed. So how do you do this? Well, of course, you have to compromise, right? And the compromise that's done is this way, by Harry Beck. And it's the London Underground. He compromised this way. Scale is thrown away. Scale is thrown away. But yet, rigor is sort of present in the following sense. If you know that the green line goes here, we know that the orange line goes north of it. right? He keeps relative positions to each other, and he also knows. If you live in the suburbs of the green line, you already know the scale over here. You know every stop's going to take you 15 minutes anyway. By the time you come into the city, you know every stop's going to take you about a minute and a half. He already knows you're in the system. Using human knowledge and using human, uh, human usage of this map, he restructured it for extreme clarity. And this, is, this tool has been used almost in every metro map system in this world based on this work of Harry Beck, who's an electrical engineer. It's stunning. I think this is the kind of compromise that's needed that's bringing math and art together where artistic visual gifting can be used without, but both sides need to compromise in the way these tools can be done. Here's another example, one of my favorite examples, which is generalization. I'm not sure if many of you guys even know it, but you use it all the time. Here's generalization, all right, here we are. This is ripped off, by the way, every image is illegally ripped off of the web. Um, <laughs> this is uh, an image from Google Maps right here. And uh, here's, here's Williamstown, we see, um, we see the science quad right there. And here's route two. And what happens is you can, the most important thing I think in the map is the left side, that little toggle bar. Right? You, can actually, you can actually change the zoom scale of this thing. We've all done this thing. And you can zoom out. 
and you can zoom out even more. What's interesting is this picture. I love this picture because everyone in this room who's looking at this picture does not say, dear God, Route 2 is the size of the science quad. Right? <laughs> it's like a 30-lane highway. I mean, like, oh my. Like, has, does Morty know? Right? Nobody's doing this. Because in your heads, you know, oh, you're reading a map. Oh, and I see at the scale you're at. This is just emphasizing the fact Route 2, 43, and 7 are sort of the big roads in Williamstown. Because what you're doing is you're generalizing. What that means is you're making room for Route 2 to get space, but at the same time, you're destroying things that it's taking the space from. Right? You're making choices. You're saying Route 2 is more important than these other things I want to emphasize. I want to push that away. But that needs to be emphasized itself. That means that gets pushed away. That church building is not that important if you're writing in Route 2. But that marker of Route 7 is important, or the cemetery is important. So you focus on certain things and generalize. So this is the question my students and I asked. We asked the following question a couple of years ago in the summer. See that toggle bar? Why should we worship that toggle bar? We do, right? We're like, kajika, kajika. That's all we do, right? And it's always done at a certain scale. One, you know, one inch equals one mile. One inch equals 10 miles. One inch equals 50 miles. It's always done classically. The reason it's been done that way is that's the way cartographers have always done it. They know the thickness of the pen. Every cartographer knows this thing. Thickness of the pen to use when you're drawing rivers at a certain scale. They know the color to use. They know the thickness of the brushes. They know exactly which shorts to put in and which shorts to take out out of tradition. The cartography fathers before them and the cartography mothers before them have taught it to them. But we have one thing they never had. We have Google. We have a computer. We have the Apple iPhone that we can just futz around with, and it does amazing things that has never been thought of before. So here's the question we can do. If I take my hand on the left hand and move the toggle bar up and down to the way I want it, how does this thing change? Right? How can you generalize? So we asked this question, and we came up with an answer. Right? And here's our answer. Right? So let me just explain this to you. On the top left corner, you see these regions. And over time, as you move the toggle bar up and down, they either sh expand or they shrink down. And they expand and shrink down, preserving something. So notice this region called C and D that are in the bottom left-hand corner in the top part. As they grow, D in the beginning part is about three times smaller than C. And at the end, it still stays three times smaller than C. Right? You want to keep the area ratios between these guys as you change this. And we encapsulated this thing in terms of a partial differential equation. And we used the theory of homotopy theory, this classical topological math theory, to try to come up with this thing. So then you say, Great, sell it to Google, right? This is amazing. But Google doesn't care because this thing doesn't work, right? And the reason it doesn't work is because it's, un, it's not implementable at all, right? Theoretically, it makes sense. Mathematically, it makes sense. But you cannot compute these things on the fly. There's no way this is going to work. And how is the visual data going to be altered as you do this thing? Google really cares about the display of information the right way. But what this is is a step in that direction, right? The step in the direction of making these guys meet. So we submitted this to numerous journals, numerous journals on cartography. You know, that's, that's academic world, right? You do something, you think it's great, you submit it to a journal, have them give you a seal of approval. So let me just give you some quotes from the journal of referees, right? <laughs> Referee comments. This paper should be interesting for people who work on automation and algorithms for cartographic generalization to read and evaluate. Awesome, this is it, this guy knows, man. This is exactly, this is who we're aiming at, right? Here's another one. To be honest, I can't make heads or tails of the theory, which seems a lot more complicated than it needs to be. All right, so now the editor's going around. I'm not sure I'm gonna take this paper right here. Here's the third one. The complete absence of anything to do with geography <laughs> reveals their complete and absolute ignorance of both the discipline of cartography and the discipline of geography. All right, got shot down, right? <laughs> In flames, it's gone. Editor writes back, hey, um, yeah, that's it, right? No words of, con no other reference articles that don't even go anywhere. But eventually, this past month, we just found out it got accepted. You just push through, and this is what I mean by life is pain. When you bring these worlds together, there is no easy PowerPoint slide that answers this thing. Right? Artists aren't going to come to you and say, wow, this is great. I want to work on this. Mathematicians aren't going to say, now I get it. There's money in here. There's nothing. Right? You've got to push these worlds together that don't ever want to exist together classically, unless you have somebody like Leonardo, somebody like uh, da Vinci pushing this way through with his mindset. So here's something else we can look at, right? origami. Let me start by just showing what classically is known about origami or thought. Here's one, paper folding, right? Just pop-up books. 
Let me just start by just explaining these two guys, Robert Sabuda and Matt Reinhardt. If you guys have never seen their pop-up books, go and get it now. <laughs> Stunning. So they have this three series of pop-up books, books called Prehistoria, about the historic uh, like dinosaurs and great monsters that lived in the water at that time period. Absolutely gorgeous. In fact, Matt Reinhardt just uh, has this new one about the complete pop-up book on the Star Wars universe. They're just gorgeous, gorgeous pieces of work. Just artistically amazing, mathematically stunning in the way you can pack all this stuff. And, but let me, let me be serious about how this is cutting edge, right? Here's one. Kurubayashi, she had a stent design. Who she was, she was a medical student. She went to visit her friends in Japan. In Japan, they have an origami museum, world renowned. She just happened to be walking through it, right? She always wants to check it out. She has an idea, comes back, and she designs a stent based on origami design. A stent is something you place in your, in your arteries after like a angioplasm or something to open it up more, right? So this design, this uh, made out of paper, actually unfolds like this, right? It's absolutely gorgeous how she came up with this thing. And you know, this whole concept of a stent design is now a $5 billion industry. And if you can pack things a little bit more efficiently, like if you can shave off 5%, it's huge, it's absolutely huge. Here's another one, the James Webb Space Telescope. This small picture that I ripped off does not do it any justice. It is literally the size of the Star Destroyer in Star Wars. It's huge, it's absolutely huge. How do you get this thing, which is supposedly gonna be unbelievable compared to Hubble, right? How do you get this thing up there? It's simple, you fold it up, that's it. The whole space telescope, the space telescope is designed to be folded to be put into the space station, I mean, to put into the space shuttle and then unfold it when it gets up there. In fact, uh, one of the big projects nowadays that NASA's working on is to build a mirror that is t uh, about 100 times the surface area is the size of the Hubble mirror. It's huge, but then yet you wanna fold it up, this mirror. But remember, you wanna minimize the creases, so you wanna preserve as much of the real information that's coming through as you can and send it into space. This whole concept of packaging, efficiency, that's what origami is about. So let me give you a snapshot of the current Da Vinci's that exist today in origami. The masters, Robert Lang. Without a doubt, this guy, Robert Lang, is in the Western Hemisphere the greatest origami artist there is. Untouched. He designed something called the Black Forest Cuckoo Clock. If you're into origami folding, it is like the holy grail. It is unbelievable. It takes a sheet of paper two feet wide, 20 feet long to make it, right? And uh, not only that, he also has a PhD from Caltech in applied physics. And not only that, he's a computer scientist who happened to, given any shape that you want, any basic origami building <coughs> shape that you want to improve on, will spit out a program, data like this, that tells you exactly the order in which to fold things. It's called Tree Maker. I mean, this is Da Vinci, right? He is Da Vinci, he is the artist, he's the computer scientist, he's the mathematician, he's pushing things, he's amazing. Another one, and this one will be extremely famous in your days, trust me on this, is Eric Demain. Eric Demain, he has a MacArthur Fellow in 2003. At the age of 20, maybe he got his uh, MacArthur Fellowship when he was 22 and he was old. But at the age of 20, he became the youngest professor at MIT ever. Right now he's 24 years old. He's written hundreds and hundreds of articles. He has hundreds of collaborators. And um, not only that, I mean, he's a computer science, theoretical computer science god. But not only that, he designed some of these things, which is the first time that people have actually started seeing curved origami. Using flat pieces of paper, you get curvature, right, using origami folding. So here's a couple of his designs. His dad, whose name is Martin Demain, who homeschooled him, his dad actually, um, due to Eric pulling strings, shall we say, is an associate visiting professor at MIT also. And he has a glass blowing lab right next to Eric's office. Coincidence? I don't know. <laughs> but, um, so we have this, here's a design, and if you want to <laughs> really believe that this guy is an artist, not just a theoretical computer scientist, these works are gonna be in the Museum of Modern Art starting in a month, right, on display. It's amazing in New York. Um, relate, I mean, understood by the world to know that he is one of these Da Vinci's to, to look after. So how do we, you know, how do we follow these guys and understand what they do? You just try to be their friends, and that's what I did. <laughs> so here's, um, here's a mathematical theory, and here's a theorem proved by Eric Demain, myself, Joe Mitchell, who's a geometry, a geometry professor at Stony Brook, and Joe O'Rourke, a professor in computer science in Smith. Here's what this theorem says. If an origami exists, then it can be folded. Now, if you think about this, this is actually a, this is pathetic. What do you mean, if it exists, it can be folded? Well, how's it gonna exist if you don't fold the thing, right? <laughs> yeah, we're brilliant, man. <laughs> I mean, see, that's the point about Eric Demain. He could spit, and he could publish an article right there on a spit. <laughs> 
So let me explain to you this theorem, okay? Here's the way the theorem goes. You take a piece of paper and you give this piece of paper to a six-dimensional being, all right? The six-dimensional being has powers of folding, not just in three dimensions that we do, but powers of folding in six dimensions. So this person starts folding, maybe the paper goes through itself, right? Maybe they're doing things that we can't do, right? Maybe the paper goes through itself, they do some folding. At the end of the folding, they, they rig it up so that the paper lands in a three-dimensional world, right? In a three-dimensional part of their six-dimensional space. So in the beginning, it starts as a flat piece of paper, two-dimensional paper. They use six-dimensional powers, and they end up with a three-dimensional origami. And since you're 3D and that paper's 3D, they give it back to you. You pick up the space of paper and you say, can I possibly do this? I mean, do I need six dimensions of power to make this thing? And we showed that you don't, right? If the three-dimensional thing exists in your hand, you just need three dimensions of power, right? That's what it is. And what's amazing, what I love about this proof, what I think it's remarkable is the fact that the proof is this picture. 95% of the proof is this picture. We actually use that origami design, that origami that exists as a scaffolding in order to build the folding that we need to build it in the first place. That's the idea behind it. So this is the way pictures actually can be rigorous. Of course you need stuff to defend and explain the values in this picture, but that's the heart of the argument. So let me just close this origami section by talking about 3D folding. And what I mean by 3D folding is the following. What if you take that piece of paper and instead of just folding it and leaving the ends open, you close the entire piece of paper up? Remember how I told you about unpacking the cube into the Roman cross in the very beginning? Imagine it that way. Imagine you have a cube made up of very hard cardboard, but the edges of the cube are perforated so they flex. Right? The question is, can you ever build any 3D thing that's all closed up, that's all closed up, can you ever build any three-dimensional thing made up of hard cardboard where the edges are perforated and flexed so that the entire thing flexes? If you build a cube that is made up of hard cardboard with perforated edges, I guarantee the cube will not even move because each of the cardboard perforations will cancel out anything else that you're trying to push through. It's extremely rigid. So the question is, can you build anything ever that actually flexes? Nobody knew. For 100 years since this problem was asked, nobody knew. In fact, every example anybody ever tried was rigid. So the belief was, it's always going to be rigid. 1978, Bob Connolly from Cornell. There exists flexible polyhedra. He needed a polyhedra made up of 30 triangles glued together in just the right way to pull it off. And later on, about five or 10 years later, um, another person whose name I've just, Stefan, came up with this model right here. It's made up of 14 triangles. It's currently proven that this is the smallest flexible polyhedra in existence. And I could take this thing. These are actually made up of plexiglass that my students in my art studio class made. It's made of plexiglass with uh, piano hinges that you use like lifting a piano, uh, a piano bar. And, uh, and you can just flex it, right? It's amazing. This thing is stunning. You guys should check it out afterwards. This is it. There's the theorem, and there it is. They made one out of metal and one out of plexiglass. So you can actually see this concrete thing. Now, here's the unsolved question. Why does it work? Are there other ones you can come up with other than this handful of ones we know? Nobody has a clue. I think artists and those gifted visually have a far more sense of what's going on than mathematicians do, than computer scientists do. Their gifting in this unsolved area of just flexibility will be a tremendous, tremendous push that we can allow if mathematicians are willing to open that door, which is really hard to open if you've been trained not to do it. So the last thing I want to close with in about five minutes is just the following thing, configurations. This is how I started doing my math way back when, and uh, this is what I'm still excited about. So let's look at what I mean by configurations. Okay, imagine you have this blue screen with these three points just moving anywhere. These particles can go wherever they want here. They cannot leave the blue box, but they cannot also hit uh, the black bars. That's illegal for them to do. And here's the question. What is the space of all ways these three guys can exist here? That's the question. What's every possibility ever? If you take a chessboard and your chess pieces, you know, all possible legal moves, if you think about that, that's a huge amount of combinations, right? And you know, one legal move is related to another one if you can go from one to the other one by moving your knight or your rook. Imagine this, every second I'm taking a snapshot of this thing, the possible spaces and how they're all related together, this whole thing is called a configuration space. And it's useful to study this enormous space of possibilities if you're building a factory, if you want to know how the robotic arm is gonna move when you're building that car to make sure it doesn't smash into the other robotic arm that's trying to put the hood on. Right? It's useful for uh, protein folding, the way the protein's built into your body. It's actually, as it's created, it looks like an origami folding rod that's coming out. 
if you can keep track of the space of all such possibilities, it's gonna be extremely useful to study that space. So the question that I asked was a really, really simple question. You take a triangle, you take three points moving on the triangle. That's all they can do. What is the space of all ways three particles can move on a triangle? What's the space they can move and collide and interact? What's the space of all that? It turns out, I drew this picture, it was this. It's the one thing I can actually claim as my own. This is the space of all possible ways three particles can move in a triangle. It's tiled by these complicated things. It fits together, but visually, there it is. And then I asked this other question, motivated by this work by Kapranov, who's a brilliant algebraic geometer. How many ways can you take five letters, A, B, C, D, E, and multiply them? Let's pretend A times B is not the same thing as B times C and then multiplied by A. Let's pretend the order in which you multiply things are really important. Right, you have five things. The space of all ways, you can multiply five letters, turns out to be this space. Right? It's another three-dimensional world. And what was remarkable is the fact that these two spaces are the same. Right? They're identical. The way you multiply five things and the way three particles can collide on, on a triangle is the same, and the proof is this. That's it. I mean, this is amazing that I actually published it in a journal that said this proof is okay. Right? It was a great math journal that I was happy about. And here's the way the proof goes. You take your triangle, and you can think of these as these three black points. I just rip one of those black points off, and I make it flat, and I tell you how things are multiplied. That's it. But these spaces, I mean, these concepts down here are related to these topological spaces. So you can ask this other question. How about four particles moving? And if you do that, you get into the world of four dimensions, not just three. So you get pictures like this. These are tiles of my four-dimensional world. These are tiles of my four-dimensional world that looks complicated, but if you stare at this long enough, and here's an example of one, right? Here's the one-dimensional skeleton of one of these guys, right? So you can see how the different three-dimensional models relate to one another, and if you look at the, and if you just stare at these things long enough, just physically, you can prove that all of these are the same. They're the same. There's nothing different about them. It looks different, but they're the same. And if you want to know, well, what about six dimensions? What if I have 18 particles moving? Is it all gonna be the same? Yes. And the reason is this. The proof is the same. Right? Just visually, you can do this. And then here's some unsolved problems nobody has a clue about. What if you take not triangles, but these other graphs, these other concepts? What kind of stuff do you get? Nobody knows. Is it related to multiplication in a different way that we don't know about? Nobody knows. So I just wanted to give you guys a glimpse of attempts that I think is possible for somebody gifted in art, somebody gifted in visualization could work at. And the things I'm interested in is origami, cartography, configuration spaces. There are numerous others if mathematicians are willing to open up. Thank you. <laughs>